everyone right to go? Thanks for joining us for the daily update. First things first, there are 17,683 aggregate confirmed cases of coronavirus in Victoria. That's 240 new cases since our update yesterday. Uh, I'm saddened to have to report that there are now 376 Victorians who have passed away as a result of this global pandemic. That's an increase of 13 since our update yesterday. Of course, our thoughts, prayers and best wishes are with each of those 13 families. We wish them well at what will be a very difficult time for them. By way of information, I can confirm that one male in their 70s, six females in their 80s, five females and one male in their 90s. Uh, that is the composition of those 13 tragedies. Eight of those deaths are linked to outbreaks in aged care settings. Uh, there are 622 Victorians in hospital, 43 of those are receiving intensive care and 28 of those 43 are on a ventilator. A total of 2,028,909 test results have been received from laboratories, which is an increase of 20,279 on tests since yesterday. So that is uh, back to that around 20,000 mark. Uh, and again, I'll take this opportunity to uh, thank every Victorian who's coming forward and getting tested. Uh, it really is critical for us to have a proper picture of how much virus is out there uh, and to make sure that we're isolating those who are positive away from other people to try and drive that R naught number. Uh, so the number of people on average that an infected person in turn infects, uh, that's how we drive numbers down, by having not every person who's got the virus infecting one other, but every second, every third, every fourth, and so on, that's how we finish up halving and halving again and, and, and putting that pressure on those numbers and getting them down to a much, much lower level, uh, particularly uh, Ballarat, Bendigo, Geelong. Uh, but again, this, this applies right across Victoria. If you've got symptoms, even the milder symptoms, please come forward as soon as you experience the onset of those symptoms, no matter how mild, uh, get tested, isolate till you get your results, it's, a, it's just a massive contribution that you can make at a very, very personal level to the cumulative fight, the fight that we're all in against this wicked enemy. Uh, I can confirm uh, that there are 3,784 cases with an unknown source. That's uh, 33 that have been closed out. That coronavirus detective work has closed those case, cases out since yesterday, so 33 since yesterday. There are uh, 753 healthcare workers who are active cases. Uh, there are 1,811 active cases in aged care settings and the total number of active cases is 4,864. Uh, Alan will go to uh, why those numbers have dropped substantially over the last couple of days. Uh, there's been a power of work gone on uh, in terms of that exit process, if you like, going back and making sure that people are without symptoms uh, and can return to uh, normal, or at least COVID normal. I mentioned those regional cities a moment ago. Let me just give you the split on active cases. These numbers never tally because there's always a few that are still being investigated, but as best we can, uh, 4,864, that's the total active across Victoria. 4,438 of those are in Metro Melbourne or Stage 4 restriction local government areas. There are 295 uh, that are in regional local government areas uh, under stage three. Uh, there's a handful of interstate residents and there's, there's about 130 odd that we are still investigating. So that is good news. Uh, if you remember, we had uh, significantly higher numbers uh, up over 500, if memory serves correctly, uh, in regional Victoria. Those numbers are coming right down and that's very good, uh, but you've got to keep coming forward and getting tested. We've got to keep those test numbers up so that we can have that most accurate of pictures. And just to give you the, again, across those three sites, uh, Greater Geelong, 118 active cases, Greater Bendigo, 27 active cases, uh, Ballarat and surrounds, uh, 18 active cases. So those numbers uh, are, are more than stabilising. They're in fact coming down. Total numbers across regional Victoria are coming down. That shouldn't lead to any sense of uh, complacency. Uh, that's exactly what we want that they were always low. We want to keep them there and drive them down even further. Uh, but getting tested and of course following the rules is a critically important part of that. I, uh, I don't know that I have any other... Oh, sorry, I'll just do the uh, very broadly the aged care outbreaks 
uh, and cases, as I said before, uh, 1,811 uh, current uh, aged, uh, aged care active cases uh, and trends in relation to where they're presenting remain absolutely consistent. Uh, 1806 private, five public. Uh, and beyond that, I don't have any other things to update you on. What I'm going to do now, though, is ask the Treasurer uh, to speak to some important extensions of residential and commercial tenancy arrangements. So, for want of a better term, a freeze on anybody being uh, evicted, uh, as well as some strengthening of some advocacy uh, and oversight arrangements uh, for those commercial and residential tenancy agreements, uh, and also the extension of the framework that we've had in place. So, just as JobKeeper has been extended by the Commonwealth Government, just as Job uh, Seeker uh, at that higher rate has been extended by the Commonwealth Government, um, we are today announcing the extension and the refinement of those important protections, both for uh, families and individuals who are renting, but also businesses who've got commercial arrangements and who, uh, through no fault of their own, have got turnover that is a fraction of what it was this time last year. So I might throw over to the Treasurer now. He can take you through the details of that. Uh, and then we're happy to take... Uh, then perhaps Alan can give you a few minutes on the numbers of the day, and uh, then we're happy to take any questions you have. Thanks very much, Premier, and uh, thanks uh, all for being here today. Look, uh, nobody should be worried about losing a roof over their head uh, right now, particularly given the uh, circumstances around social distancing, uh, but also the associated economic consequences of uh, the pandemic event that the uh, entire world is confronting. So we need to provide certainty to people uh, who lose their homes or their businesses, and we need to help tenants and landlords find some common ground. Um, uh, that's why we're going to extend an, uh, on evictions and rental increases, the ban on evictions and uh, rental increases until the end of the year. Under the extensions, uh, evictions will continue to be banned for residential and commercial tenants until December the 31st, um, unless in rare and specific circumstances. Rental hikes continue to be banned until the end of the year also. Uh, everyone in these difficult times needs to pull together. This is about making sure that we strike the right balance and that we also ensure uh, that those who depend upon uh, tenancy arrangements uh, for uh, their shelter, their homes, uh, are provided with adequate safeguards. It's also about making sure that we strike the right balance and we provide support and assistance to landlords who do the right thing by their tenants. So um, those uh, uh, rental hikes, which will continue to be banned until the end of the year. Um, everyone, uh, as I've said, needs to pull together. In the last four months, what we've seen is uh, close to 26,000 agreements uh, for reduced rent have been registered with Consumer Affairs Victoria. Uh, the Small Business uh, Victoria Commission um, uh, has, or Victorian Small Business Commissions, also helped something like 8,000 rent-related inquiries uh, most of those have been uh, helped, help that has been brokered uh, to find common ground between tenants and landlords, and that's the way that the system should work. It's about uh, providing uh, facilitative uh, capacities wherever that is possible, uh, um, recognising that, of course, the material circumstances of landlords and tenants uh, vary considerably across the spectrum, across the arrangements that they've struck. And therefore, there's no capacity really to have a one-size-fits-all approach, but there are things that the government can do to help people reach agreement uh, and ultimately to provide some support for the agreements that they do strike. Uh, we're also introducing some additional measures uh, with the commercial landlords required to provide rent relief uh, in proportion with falls in turnover. So up until now, those uh, that uh, uh, proportionality principle is uh, been uh, aspired to, but we will uh, now make it a very clear and express intention that uh, if you're uh, identifying a, uh, a downturn in your capacity, uh, your turnover, then uh, you should have an expectation that that is similarly reflected in terms of the rent relief that you get. Uh, residential and commercial landlords uh, will be able to take more advantage of more support, including, uh, for example, further land tax reductions uh, and more grant funding. 
The government's also going to extend the uh, land tax relief available and make it easier to access. Um, landlords that provide outright rent waivers of at least 50% of rent payable for at least three months uh, will be eligible for an additional 25% land tax relief. Uh, a $60 million fund additionally will be established for eligible small commercial landlords uh, um, and that will provide up to $3,000 per tenancy. And we're encouraging banks, of course, to continue to do uh, the right thing by uh, their, uh, uh, their customers to ensure that uh, everybody gets the best opportunity to make it through to the other side of this event. Additionally, um, we are going to invest uh, some $600,000 in a package to uh, support advocacy groups uh, uh, such as VCOS, Tenants Victoria and others to support vulnerable tenants so that they understand their rights and to assist them in the mediation processes. So to get through this together, um, uh, all of us, tenants, landlords, businesses, governments, banks, we need to work together. Uh, and certainly these arrangements, which seek to strike that right balance, are aimed at ensuring that uh, where the right thing is done by a landlord uh, for a tenant, where they comply with the uh, eligible criteria, then they too will, can expect that the state will provide them with relief as well. Thanks, Premier. Uh, Thanks, uh, Treasurer and uh, Premier. So um, the, the eagle-eyed among you will notice that um, there's been a decrease, a sharp decrease in the uh, number of active cases, um, 2,291 uh, since yesterday. I'd probably just explain the process of um, how an active case is cleared, and it's a process we call um, release from isolation. Um, so for a lot of people, it, um, it involves a, well, for most people, it involves um, a case interview that's a bit like um, the opposite of um, the case investigation that we do at the start. Um, so it does take um, an assessment by um, a, a trained health professional. Um, what it uh, does involve is um, making sure that their symptoms have cleared and enough time has lapsed since the start of their illness to allow them to, uh, um, to be uh, released from isolation. But for some, um, for some cases, for some patients um, that, who have ongoing symptoms or people that have more severe disease that are in hospital or have been in hospital or, or for some that have um, impaired immune systems, um, they require additional swabs. So it's not a, it's not a simple process. Um, a lot of work has gone in over the last couple of days to clear um, uh, people from um, isolation so that they can um, go back into the, um, uh, to their normal activities. Um, so just to confirm, not everyone who's been like recovered is retested, just those with a more severe Yeah, illness. so there, there's ver very good evidence and in line with international guidance um, uh, for most people um, that don't have any complicating factors, um, it's 10 days and three days after the resolution of their symptoms, they don't need additional swabs. Um, but for those that um, have impaired immune systems, um, any sort of risk factors, um, uh, if they're still in hospital, for example, then um, we require that they have negative swabs before Obviously they leave. Why not, sorry, why not swab everyone? Uh, so it's not necessary in um, most people and there's, uh, so for example in um, people actually that don't have severe disease actually um, become less infective fairly quickly actually. So um, uh, in Taiwan there was a, a study where they followed up um, contacts of people and after about six days there were no cases um, that resulted from contact after uh, about six or seven days. There's a bit of obviously a bit of a safety margin built into that so, um, uh, so and we do need to make sure that their symptoms have resolved. Obviously we haven't had two... Sorry, just to follow on that. Just, yeah. um, what about for those people who are asymptomatic at the beginning of the disease and stay yep. asymptomatic? So, the, uh, so how do you determine that they have actually recovered? Yep, so, uh, so in that case, um, the national guidelines say that it's 10 days from the date of the positive swab. Um, so that's deemed to be the start of their illness. Um, so yep. what was it before? Was it 14 days? I oh, know, it's, no, it's 10 days. So what was it before? You said so, there's so, been a lot of work So just to draw a distinction between um, what's called quarantine and isolation. Isolation is for uh, people that have been unwell, and that's um, uh, 10 days um, uh, plus, uh, sorry, 10 days and three days after the resolution of their illness. So sometimes if they're not well at the end of 10 days, then it will be longer than that. 
quarantine is for well people that have been exposed that are at risk, and that's to do with how long it takes to become unwell after you've been exposed, and that's 14 days. So that's obviously, you know, there's a lot of confusion about that sometimes. And what it can mean is that um, people that become unwell actually are released before people who aren't unwell, but that's just the property of, um, of the disease. But, but what's changed over the last few days so that we've got rid of the, a lot of these active cases? So, uh, so there's, there's been this interview process um, that's been allocated to um, Health Direct staff, to, um, so tra trained health professionals to go and interview these people to make sure that um, they have indeed recovered, that they meet the criteria for release from um, isolation. And has there been an administrative lag in sort of adding these numbers to the tally? I mean, obviously, we haven't had 2,300 people recover in 24 hours. Yeah, so I understand that it's um, gone to Health Direct to be allocated, and then the data has now come back. So I don't think they were all called yesterday, um, but um, it's been over the last couple of days. Um, how optimistic, then, should we be by this sort of reduction to have active case numbers in the 4,000s rather than the 7,000s? Look, I think what's important is actually the new case numbers. Um, they're still um, uh, 240 um, today, so um, those numbers are still too high. Um, but um, you know, they're not 700, um, which we were a couple of weeks ago. So they are coming down. They're going in the right direction. We're not looking for you know single, you know, days uh, figures, um, but a, a trend over time, and that trend is coming down. Those 240 are they in aged care, healthcare workers? Are, are you? confident you know where they are or these again in the community and still that's an issue? Yeah, so we, we can give you a more detailed breakdown in the CHO, um, but um, most of them are in metropolitan Melbourne. There's not um, so many outside of um, the stage four restriction area now in regional Victoria. Um, and then the other figures can come out and in there. Do you the believe that they are, what's the trend the last couple of days, is, is that in workplaces rather than in the community? Oh, I mean, I think there is still in a variety of settings. We worry a lot about still aged care and workplaces, um, but um, you know, there are less of them. Um, there are less new outbreaks, which is um, encouraging. But again, it's sort of we don't sort of look at day by day figures. We look at it um, over a longer period of time. We did see in yesterday's figures that health and aged care were still going up, even though the overwhelming trend is is down. Are you concerned about sort of getting areas where the restrictions aren't making that much difference? And I guess you know, are you concerned about the um, impact that might have on our ability to transition out of these restrictions in a few weeks? Outbreaks are, are really important settings um, and uh, that includes aged care and, um, and, and healthcare workers in aged care in hospitals. Um, we, we need to get those under control and in, the numbers are going down with um, the number of outbreaks that are out there um, and uh, that is going to be one of the main sort of considerations we have when we start to think about um, what we might be doing next. How worried are you about the testing figures? I know we've had a slight recovery today but the last few days have been down. How concerned, uh, how much of a priority is that for health officials behind the scenes? Well, it's, it's really important that everyone who is unwell um, in any way gets um, uh, gets tested. Um, so it's always hard to know when you see figures go down, is it actually because uh, there's actually less illness out there? And for example, we know there's hardly any influenza out there because of presumably what we're doing to control COVID as well. Um, but um, it's also important that we encourage people who might be unwell to, um, to get out there. We do know that, for example, you know, a lot of people are getting tested at Chadston Shopping Centre and um, no longer doing that because um, people aren't going to Chadston anymore. Um, but th and there's a, obviously a wide ra range of um, places for people to get tested and um, we just make encourage people to, to get tested if they are unwell. So, so you, how do you drill down and try to find out why the numbers are going down? Are you sort of speaking to everybody on the side about what people are saying? Yeah, so I mean, we can look at um, where where the test, which sites are active, which sites um, are, are less active. Um, we, uh, we'll look at, um, for example, in in regional Victoria, where um, testing dropped off for a bit, and we saw a few cases. Um, we, uh, you know, there was an encouragement to get for regional Victorians to go and get tested. Um, we can look at uh, some um, metrics such as um, the proportion of uh, tests that are positive, and actually that's been relatively low. So, um, you know, for example, in other countries, um, a sign that um, uh, um, people might be being missed is if that proportion is really high. You know, every tenth person is tested. That um, you know, then uh, if they're positive, then we'd be worried that there's a there's an iceberg that we're missing. 
but um, in Victoria at the moment it's sort of sitting around uh, 1% or even less in a lot of places. With testing, I know you say that there's not much value in testing people who are asymptomatic, but there are still so many people who have been told they should get tested because there's been a coronavirus scare at a workplace and their <laughs> employer would really prefer if they get tested just to be safe, but they're getting turned back because they don't have any symptoms and it's getting to the point that they have to lie and say that they've got a cough just to get the test result. Do you yeah. think that's so, fair? So we, what we are trying to do is to use the testing capacity that we have to test people who are most likely to have illness. So, you know, there's six and a half million Victorians, you know, we can't test everyone. But, uh, and there are certainly circumstances where testing asymptomatic people is warranted and that's workplaces where there's an outbreak um, uh, and uh, particularly high, high risk workplaces. We're not you know, the testing people aren't the police. We're not going to, you know, look in your throat and make sure you really have a sore throat or not. Um, but um, we are trying to make sure that um, we're using the testing on people that actually need it and are most likely to have infections so that we can stop, um, we, so we can get those tests back as quick as we can and to shut down that transmission chain. There's still a high number of mystery cases. Are you concerned that that number is not going down? Look, it probably it, it goes up and down. Um, I think that uh, it, it partly depends on you know um, when that you know the case investigation process. Um, I, I think the overall numbers are coming down. The outbreaks are coming down. Uh, I'm encouraged by those, but we still do need to look into those uh, mystery cases as best we can. Professor, we're two weeks into stage four. Um, what number daily case? number would you be comfortable with for us to then transition into that stage three? Look that's a discussion that we're having over the, um, the, the next week or so. Um, it would be substantially lower than it is now. Um, uh, so you know I think I won't give you a figure but um, you, know, you know single digits or even uh, low double digits but it does also depend on you know if there are mystery cases then we will worry more about those so it's not going to be a single figure um, and, and there are going to be a number of other things that need to be in place before. Well, is there a figure for mystery cases? I'm sorry? Is there a figure for mystery cases that you'll be looking at? I, I would uh, in general a mystery case means that there's at least one other out there um, so I would be happier to not to have any of those but um, again how long you know exactly over how, what period of time and uh, you know that will be uh, yet to be determined. So even if we're in single digits of daily cases if there's still mystery cases out there we won't be opening up we, that's to be determined and it really depends on um, you know some of the details of those cases so when we get down and you know we're seeing this in the regions at the moment um, when we're getting down to relatively small numbers um, we can you know start to drill down very carefully into um, in, into the data to see um, where they might have got it um, so we should be able to close out some of those mystery cases a bit better are you frustrated at how slowly cases are going down. They seem to be hovering about those mid 200s now for a few days. Would you have been hoping that it would have been going down a bit quicker? Oh look, I, th I think it, you know numbers uh, numbers go up and down. Um, I would it's the long term trends that I'm looking for, and um, you know we're hopeful by you know next week they'll uh, continue to go down. Um, whether there's a bit of wobble in it, you know 240, 220, um, I'm not quite so worried about. But um, I would like to see you know over a number of days um, that it continues to come down. Just with the land tax um, offer of 50% discount, how much are you budgeting will be a hit to the land tax revenue? Oh, well, at the moment, it's um, uh, essentially a work in progress. Obviously, the amount that we budget for will be directly dependent upon the amount of claims that are made. And, and to claim, of course, you have to qualify. Um, uh, our expectation is that um, uh, we will see uh, claims uh, in excess of uh, uh, $100 million in excess of that. Um, I, I'm loathe to put hard numbers on this, so because uh, essentially it does depend upon landlords striking appropriate arrangements uh, with, their, um, with their tenants. Uh, they have to qualify uh, uh, in order to uh, 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 access these arrangements. But uh, the point that I'd make is Additional to that, of course, we are providing additional relief uh, for landlords uh, that are uh, essentially doing the right thing. So um, in circumstances where uh, we are now increasing that access uh, from 
25% up to 50% of their land tax rebate, uh, should they do uh, uh, the right thing. Um, uh, uh, we're also establishing that $60 million fund for eligible landlords, um, who essentially therefore will be able to uh, uh, enter a hardship scheme, which will provide them something like $3,000 per tenancy, but once again, uh, they'll need to qualify. transition from stage four into stage three and what a stage three, how it may differ to what we saw in stage three previously, can, can well, I can, where yeah, we're at. I, I can certainly confirm for you that there's quite a lot of work going on around what that next phase might look like, but it's all dependent on uh, case numbers. And as Alan, I think, has just made the point that it's not just about the raw number of new cases. It'll be some of the circumstances that sit behind those. So to, I suppose, just to, to, uh, to make Alan's point in a slightly different way, uh, if you had very low numbers of community transmission or mystery cases and you had, uh, you know, uh, 20 cases, but they were all linked to known and contained outbreaks, well then that's a very, that, that uh, is, is in fact in some respects a lower number than it might seem. But again, it's too early, sadly. I know it's very frustrating and we'd all love to know a clear blueprint every single day with a, and we tick them off and move from one phase to another. We would love that. The notion, I'm sure Victorians would too, but the issue around the fact that this is not just wildly infectious, but it can be stubborn. It can it can sit there and be really difficult to uh, extinguish or, or even to bring down to a much more sustainable number. Uh, and the other point, of course, too, is that it can change day to day. That's why the weekly trends are much more valuable to us. But look, these numbers are heading uh, they're heading the right way, uh, but. We've all just got to stay the course on this, and sadly, we can't give people a definitive timeline or even uh, a a really clear picture at this stage of what the next phase might look like. As soon as we can, and as soon as we've got numbers and and data that makes those sort of predictions credible, then of course we will give people as much notice as we possibly can. But as I've said a few times, this is not a sprint in any sense. This is a this is an ultra marathon, and we all just need to, to get to the other side of it. That's the most important thing. Premier, three days before you announced stage four lockdown, you made a big part of your press conference that one in four Victorians who were meant to be self-isolating were not found to be at home. Most of those cases were referred to Victoria Police. This was very concerning for a lot of people to hear. Uh, sure. It turns out that less than 1% of Victorians were actually breaching self-isolation rules. So was it irresponsible of you to jump to conclusions and let Victorians believe that far more people were breaching self-isolation and potentially spreading this virus when that was not the case? Well, I think you've answered your question in the way you framed it. I indicated they weren't at home. They weren't at home. Uh, we didn't issue on-the-spot fines. We referred it to Victoria Police. It's their job to investigate and to determine whether people had a lawful excuse not to be at home. And just as I foreshadowed, and if you, um, I'd invite you to go back and have a look. I think you were here when I made many of these comments. Uh, we didn't assume that they all weren't, they were all doing the wrong thing. Uh, there was, as I said at the time, it could be, you might choose not to answer the door. You might be isolating at another house. The address we had for you might be wrong. You might be, as Rick Nugent put it yesterday, you might be out the back in the shed. There's lots of different reasons. We didn't issue automatic fines. So I think that answers the question. Premier, I did go back and listen, and you did acknowledge that there would be a multitude of reasons yeah. why uh, they didn't answer the door, but you said that those numbers don't add up, and ultimately it wasn't good enough. And there was certainly a massive difference in about 25% of Victorians, or up to 25% of Victorians were breaching self-isolation rules when it's less than 1%. It's, it's a huge difference. I'm not sure what the question is. So... Why were you so confident or, or why did you go ahead with that press conference and say that one in four Victorians were not found to be at home, but you, you took such a long time in following up how many people had actually so been if you're, Well, again, if you're asking me why did I say that one in four people weren't home, 
because one in four people weren't home. Okay. That's why I said that. That that's a fact, and that's exactly why I made that made that point. At the same time, though, no, you've no, you've 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 asked a number of questions. Please let me have the opportunity to answer them, uh, and then you can ask me another one if you choose to. Uh, so that's a fact. One in four people weren't behind the door, didn't answer it when Victoria when when ADF and authorised officers of the health department knocked on that door. So that's a, that is a, that is a fact. Uh, beyond that, we didn't find people that day, we then referred these matters to Victoria Police, because that's the appropriate thing to do. So I'm not quite sure what the question is. I suppose it's just quite... You most certainly sorry, can. I, I no, 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 lady, no, that's fine. Let's, let's keep okay? going. I just have one... Uh, sure. Sorry, two more. Well, I suppose my question is that it's misleading, because a lot of Victorians assumed so many more people were breaching the self-isolation rules when so it's why? actually less than 1%. Again, I, I'm, not, I'm not here to ask you questions, but if I might be uh, permitted to do that, how is it misleading to inform the community that when somebody from the army and somebody from the health department knocked on a door, mm -hmm. there was no one who answered it? How is that misleading? I suppose it's misleading because less than 1% of people were actually doing the wrong thing. Yeah, but that is takes that, us back... I think that's just a, a massive part of it. Well, and that might be a fair point if we had said that it was our view that every single one of those people were doing the wrong no, thing. You, did, you acknowledge that it was a handful that were doing... Uh, that had a, maybe had a valid reason, but it was your point that there was still... the numbers didn't add up. Well, having been the one who made the point, I suppose I'm uniquely qualified to put it to you that what I said was factual, what, I, what then happened was appropriate. Uh, we didn't issue fines, and in fact I don't issue fines. Victoria Police then go and do their work, and uh, it does take some time for that work to be done. They've got... My last question on this. So sure. this was three days before Stage 4 lockdown was yep. announced. It was then a big part of the announcement on Stage 4 lockdown that... In, in fact, in the media release, it says, I know Victorians are with me when I say too many people are not taking this seriously and too many people uh, not taking this seriously means too many other people are having to plan funerals for those they love. Yes. So I suppose that kind of really points the finger at Victorians doing the wrong thing and we now know that it's far less that, w that uh, Victorians were doing the wrong thing. They weren't we thought one in, it could have been as high as one in four Victorians were breaching self-isolation. We now know it's less than 1%. So why did you make that such a big part of your announcement during stage four lockdown instead of, say, acknowledging your government's failures in hotel quarantine? Oh, so that's the real question. I'm sorry, I'm building up to that. I've acknowledged that there have been mistakes made. I've set up an inquiry to give us the answers that we need. Um, I, 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 I think we've now got to the real question. Uh, and I think what I've done, what I've said, all the way along is consistent okay, with... I won't ask about hotel quarantine. Why did you blame no, you Victorians can. on the day of Stage 4 lockdown? Pardon me, sorry? Why did you blame Victorians on the day you were announcing Stage 4 lockdown? I, I didn't do any such thing. And but if you... you say each of us knows someone who has not yeah. been following the rules as well as they yep. should have, and you did use the word um, that you were frustrated that such a large majority of people were not following the rules. So I... I understand that you don't like the question, but there is a valid point that you were blaming Victorians. No, there's no, not a question of whether pandemic. I like the question or not. Um, that, that's not. That's completely irrelevant and not necessarily accurate. Alex, can I say? Uh, I'm sorry that you didn't blame people for the spread of the virus. People not isolating for the spread of the virus. Is that what you're saying is not accurate? Uh, what, what, is, what, what we've done each and every day is try to be as frank and as honest as we possibly can be. As long as it's not before a judicial inquiry. Well, that's the night. Well, there is a judicial inquiry, an inquiry chaired by a former judge, and that is looking into a whole range of different matters, and that's uh, appropriate. So I don't know that that's a point of debate. Uh, in terms of being as frank as possible, uh, you're looking at one set of enforcement activity. There are many more fines that have been issued beyond that, and they're not issued, might I say, with the greatest of respect to people who are following the rules. They're fines and penalties for those who aren't. So you may take a different view, but they are the facts of the matter. Uh, we have over time seen too many people uh, doing the wrong thing, but that shouldn't take away from all of those who are doing the right thing. And I've tried to make that point as clearly and consistently as possible, which is why when many different examples of uh, poor choices, when many different examples of people who perhaps don't believe this virus is real 
have been put to me, I've always tried to make the point that, yeah, that, that they are serious matters, but let's not have them detract from the amazing work that I think a growing number of Victorians are doing. Uh, I, 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 I don't accept the conclusion that you're drawing about blame. I don't accept any of those. They're not, they're not uh, factual in that they are your view. You're entitled to your view. I don't share that view. Uh, I try to be as frank and direct as I can be. And yes, there will be some times when uh, the judicial inquiry uh, means that there are some matters I can't go to. That's why it's been set up. That's why it's been set up. And that's why it's doing its important work. Just really quickly on the police stats. Uh, the police said that one of the most common reasons why people weren't home was because they had the wrong address. Do we have a problem with record keeping of addresses? Look, I think that you'll always, whenever you've got a group of people, uh, there'll, there'll always be some addresses that are wrong. There'll always be individual circumstances. I think that uh, each of those, uh, each, each day, each, each door knock, um, teaches you things and you try and refine those processes and systems as much as you possibly possibly can. And the other, another key reason was the exercise loophole. Should that exercise loophole have ever existed? Well, the exercise provision was taken away uh, and that's made enforcement easier. Uh, that's not an easy decision to make in some respects, but it was the right one to make. And why was it, why was it there? Well, again, uh, I can't change that, uh, but in terms of I can't go back, uh, we have changed that that's really important. I don't know to what extent that's contributed to, to any of the challenges we face. I think what it was really, what, it, what the change, Rachel, was fundamentally motivated by was the fact that uh, Victoria Police's job will be easier if this is a really binary thing. You know, there's, there's only, for instance, getting urgent medical care. Uh, that, that would be a lawful reason not to be at home. And that's something that I think you can easily prove or otherwise. The notion of, oh, well, I wasn't there because I was out on a walk that's a much harder thing for Victoria Police to cover. So on that basis, uh, that was uh, removed. Uh, and I would just say, despite, um, despite uh, points that have been made today, uh, I don't think any of the 42 people that have got fined are particularly pleased with that. Uh, they've, 16 of those have got nearly $5,000 fines. 26 of them have got $1,652 fines. They get added to the total number of people who've been fined across the state, which I don't have that number to hand, but it's a significant number. So, you know, we have from time to time seen people make really poor choices. Uh, I've called that out where I thought that was appropriate. You can make your own judgments about whether that's a good or a bad thing to do, but I'll continue to call that out, just as I'll continue to praise the growing number of Victorians who are doing an amazing job in following rules that everyone wishes weren't there and weren't needed. Uh, so, again, that, that, that approach is well understood and it will not be changing. Right, you most certainly can, Lundy. Um, Victorian cross-border communities say they're human casualties of city-focused government policies. Um, particularly on South Australia, will you be working with the government over there to try to put some sort of localised permit system in place so that they can continue to go about their life, given how isolated a lot of yeah. those communities are? Uh, as I've said a couple of times, Jacqueline Symes has leadership on that issue, but uh, I understand that this is a matter that's being considered by National Cabinet tomorrow, uh, and hopefully we can... Uh, just bring a bit more attention and focus to this. There are some uh, very significant impacts for many different people. Uh, I'm not sure whether that uh, whether that comment relates to uh, our government or other governments, but I, I would assure I would try to uh, I would try to uh, re reassure that that person or those communities that we're doing everything we can to try and uh, make the fact that others have closed their borders to us as workable as possible. It's not easy by, by any stretch. Uh, but there's a lot of work going on and we have seen a number of concessions that have been made recently. We'll continue to fight for others so that we can have the most workable set of arrangements, noting that whenever borders are closed, there's going to be impacts. That's the, that's the nature of closing the border. Uh, but uh, that, that is on the agenda for National Cabinet tomorrow and hopefully we can, we can make some progress there. And again, I, I, I've had discussions with the Premier of New South Wales. Uh, if I need to have discussions with the Premier of... South Australia, then of course I would uh, do that. Uh, Ali Cup has made the point that South Australia is prepared to let in foreign students but not Victorians. Um, well, I think we had a question to that end uh, yeah. yesterday. That's, that's entirely a matter for them. Uh, I, I really can't add to that and it's probably not that helpful if I was to. Is, is there not a case for being a bit more proactive, given that South Australia is tomorrow tightening its restrictions? Given what we've been through with New South Wales and the problems that they've experienced, is there not an argument for being a bit more proactive with what's happening with South Australia? I'm, I'm mindful that they're not your rules, but 
trying to sure. figure this out ahead of those changes coming into place to oh, well, reduce the human impact? Yeah, well, all this has been, uh, I, I would describe what we've been doing as absolutely proactive. Um, we've got minister to minister, all sorts of meetings and discussions working through these issues. Uh, and I think that there's a genuine interest uh, and a lot of work going on to try and resolve them. Some of them we will not be able to resolve because that's the nature of closing the border. It is about limiting movement. Uh, uh, but it, it's, it's certainly not, it's not settled. There's more that needs to be done and people are working very hard to do that. And as, just as, as a, I suppose, uh, uh, just to give you a sense that it's, it's not just a matter of us and one other state or even multiple states, this does have a national um, side to it and, and that's why uh, it's on the National Cabinet agenda. Well, I think that there needs just to be a really clear acknowledgement of all the different knock-ons uh, and we'll provide, we already have provided and we'll provide some further uh, insights and some further case studies uh, and we'll seek some uh, different treatment for those uh, for whom this is, uh, well, it's a burden for many, but it can be a disproportionate impact and burden for some uh, and we're very regularly trying to make that case. But I think elevating it to a national discussion is a good thing because it's not just well, not just Victoria, obviously there are other borders that are shut to other states, New South Wales for instance and Queensland, uh, things of that nature. So it does play out in different different parts of the country. So it's just a, to my way of thinking, just a logical thing to put on the National Cabinet uh, agenda. There are concerns in regional Victoria about seasonal workers, backpackers um, travelling uh, to, I think yesterday there was a busload of backpackers who arrived in Mildura. They were travelling there for work, so presumably they weren't obliged uh, to isolate. But the Mildura community, I guess, has two concerns. One, that there are people travelling from you know, Melbourne where there's high levels of COVID to regional Victoria. Yep. But also they, they need these workers yep. as well. Is there a strategy from the government to address those two problems? Seasonal workers is something that we've... Uh, again, had a conversation some time ago now, but a conversation at National Cabinet about. I know there are some arrangements we've put in place. It's probably best if I come back to you on that one. In terms of the contact tracing, there's just reports that family members um, said that the first time that they, their mother, who died seven days before, was contacted was yes. seven days after her death. Are you going to have you got I have, information? I, that I have heard that report, um, and I want to uh, uh, again extend my condolences to that family. Uh, this will be very, very challenging time for them. Uh, I think we're just simply waiting on a family name and as soon as we get that, uh, if the family's comfortable to provide that to us, then we'll chase that up just to make sure that uh, if there's any way in which we can improve our systems and processes. Look, well, firstly, what, what happened? And then if there, are, if there are learnings from that, then of course we would, we would seek to, uh, to, to, act, to act on that. Can I break the cranks at hospital if so many staff have been infected? Is that acceptable? Is the LHNS standards working? Are you worried about that? Oh, look, there's, a, there's an outbreak, uh, an incident management team gone down there. They're all working very hard. Part of that will be trying to establish exactly what's happened. So it's probably too early, Rich, for me to make any judgments about that. I think we're all focused on trying to, uh, well, in, in the first instance, uh, to isolate those who've got it, to furlough those staff who might be the close contacts, uh, and then to find the reserve workforce to make sure that, uh, to make sure that uh, patients are getting the very best care. Uh, I've got some. Uh, I don't have. I don't have a, the latest report on that. If I've got anything to update you on in the in, in coming days, I will. But I do know that there's an incident management team, an outbreak management team, gone down there, and there's no effort being spared to try and deal with root cause, as well as uh, proper public health treatment for those who might be impacted, and then the health service response beyond that. Uh, if I can update you further, I will. Are you worried about the spread within, within healthcare workers actually at work, like socialising when they're not with patients? Is that is that a concern for you? Or well, I think the, the principal concern, and that's why we do hope to be able to come back to you in some more detail quite soon. Uh, it's a massive piece of work and obviously very challenging to get uh, all the data and all the information that you need. But our concern is to better understand, you know, is it patients who are infecting staff is it staff infecting other staff? Is it, has it come from outside the community and been brought into some of these settings? Now, the other thing too, when we talk about healthcare workers, we're not just talking about nurses in hospitals, we're talking about aged care workers also. So uh, it, it, I expect, and, and my early reports were, that it'll be a combination, uh, but exactly exact split. Some of these you won't know because they're a bit like any cohort of COVID patients. There'll be some mysteries that you just can't solve, uh, but 
uh, we're, we're hopeful to be able to come back to you with some really significant analysis and some steps. Probably not the final list of things we're going to do, but at least a good sample of some stuff that we're doing in response to that to that data. Uh, but you've, you, you afford me the important opportunity to again thank all of our health workers. They're doing an amazing job, and it's it's very challenging work. Uh, it is, you know, having talked to a number of uh, nurses and other healthcare workers in recent weeks, just offline, just listening to them uh, uh, tell me stories about what they've been doing. You know, it's very, very challenging to work long shifts, sometimes double shifts, uh, full PPE, uh, very, very difficult. But they're doing an amazing job and we're proud of them and grateful to them and that's why we're working to support them as hard as we possibly, possibly can. Back to Frankston, Premier. Um do you know anything about that outbreak, uh, that cluster spreading to other Peninsula Health installations? So we've heard that uh, we've had a, another cluster emerge at a rehab facility on Golf Links Road. Yeah, I think they're both connected to Peninsula Health, but I'm happy to come back to you. There might be some more detail we can provide you in the CHO release. Uh, and if there's further information we can provide you tomorrow or later, then of course we will. I suppose same as Rich. Is there any more help on the way for sole traders? Um, I, I think they get JobKeeper, but there's some saying it's that sort of covers living expenses but it doesn't cover business losses? Well we're always looking to see what more we can do to assist. Uh, the issue with sole traders uh, from the state government's point of view is of course we can't uh, uh, identify uh, who they are. Many of them don't actually have a, uh, a tax paying relationship with the state. However if you look at the uh, number of packages that we've announced today, uh, if you're a sole trader and you're looking for uh, uh, access to land tax relief, uh, then provided you qualify for JobKeeper, you'll also be able to access uh, the relief that's provided here. So we are where we can, trying to put in place appropriate uh, uh, support for uh, sole traders, but overwhelmingly uh, sole traders uh, essentially being provided for through the JobKeeper arrangements. Um, but where we can, we'll look to see what more we can do. We, we still have a fair way to run um, in terms of this uh, uh, event as an economic event. Uh, and the one thing that the government is very clear about is that we intend being here with the community uh, over, that, over that long haul. So um, where we can, uh, we've always sought to make sure that the uh, measures that we've put in place effectively complement the measures that the Commonwealth have put in place they're taking principal responsibility for sole traders because of the relationship that they have with sole traders through the income tax regimes. Have you got any updates on um, unemployment, GST, um, from your last last time you updated us on those things? Oh, not really. I think uh, when I produced the last uh, uh, set of data for you, we looked at um, Unemployment hitting about 11% or 325,000 jobs uh, being affected. Uh, we saw, uh, we anticipated through the revised modelling, uh, which works on the assumption of the uh, the now stage four uh, settings uh, remaining in place to the uh, identified period. Uh, we identified that there would be a 11% drop in the June quarter in GSP and a 9% drop in the September quarter. Uh, those continue to be our expectations. Alex, I'll just say it's not, it's not that I don't want to talk about it. Um, we, we, we've spent many days talking about restrictions, and that's important because it's very relevant to everyone's day-to-day -day life. We're just not in a position at the moment to be able to look at uh, the data we've got. Uh, we're into our third week. Uh, we just can't extrapolate from that data where we're going to be in a week's time, where we're going to be in three weeks' time, two, three, four, five weeks' time. It's just really difficult to know. We would always look to be as proportionate to the challenge as possible. And if something like the curfew was deemed to be uh, no longer necessary, then it will come off. It won't be on there. It won't be on. It won't be imposed for any longer than it needs to be. And that's that's the rule we've tried to apply, I think, to all the different restrictions that we've put in place. And uh, look, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely fine for us to be having these discussions. It's just really hard, I suppose, to to try and crystal ball where we might get to. And I, and I don't want to, just, just so we're clear, I, I wouldn't want to set a date. It might be easier to do that um, for a little while until that date couldn't be delivered. And then we'd be, you know, that, that's, not a, that's, not the, uh, that's not the best way to go. We've just got to 
I think, accept, as tough as it is, uh, that we've still got a long way to go in this and we've just got to keep all of us doing everything we possibly can to drive those numbers down and then down further. Uh, and then there'll be a time where we... And then, of course, debates will then start again about whether you're opening up too fast or too slow. That's just a natural part of this. Uh, that'd be a great, great day if we can get to that point again, having debates about whether we're um, opening up too fast or too slow. Uh, I think that's, that's not too far away. Uh, but we've just got to stay the course, and none of us, even though we've got numbers in the, the low 200s uh, and the trend is good, uh, we just have to acknowledge that, that even, even at that number, even at half that number, uh, if you opened up, you wouldn't have defeated the second wave, you'd just be beginning the process of a third wave, and I really don't think anybody wants that. Can I ask a non-COVID question, please? What has the V-Line CEO been accused of uh, that warrants the government yeah. suspending him from his position? Uh, I'm obviously very limited in what I can say. This is a IBAC investigation. Uh, it's not appropriate for us to be briefed on those matters other than uh, hit the board. So the Minister's made a statement today. I think that we'd get a general sense of it uh, and the board has stood him down as I understand it. Uh, but I'll direct you to Minister Carroll's statement. Uh, and then it's entirely... I make no judgments about it because it's not appropriate for me to. That's IBAC's job and IBAC will do their work and. Uh, we'll we'll let them get on with that. But what, can you not say anything about the nature of them? Are they financial related? Is all it behaviour related? Yeah, sure. All, all I can do is refer you to whatever language the minister, uh, Minister Carroll, has used. He will have been as frank as he as he can be without interfering in the work that IBAC has done. Uh, if there's any clarification or any further information we can get to you, then Laurel, of course, we will. Can I just ask you about schools? We've got some VCS sure. students going back into schools today on site to do some practical yes. work. What, what does the rest of the year look like for them? I know it's too early to talk about schools particularly, yeah. but... Um, I, get this, I get this question a lot, including in my own household. I'm sure you do. Um, <laughs> it, I mean, it, can there be special provisions for VCS students going, going forward? Where are we at with that? Yes, yeah, so obviously the, the uh, uh, Deputy Premier uh, announced a number of special... Uh, special well, we used to call it special, special consideration. We're now going to do an assessment across all VCS students. Where are they? Where could they reasonably have been expected to be? So that the difference, Erin, can be confident that the unique circumstances of 2020, it's, and they're unparalleled, uh, will be taken into account in terms of the way students are um, ranked, uh, and it should have therefore no impact uh, on uh, the options that they'll have, whether that be an apprenticeship, TAFE, university, or just joining the workforce, whatever, within that spectrum. So this is... That, that, that was a very important thing. Beyond that, there are some courses where you need to be on site and they put in place rigorous COVID safe plans, masks, all of that distance, all of those things. Uh, the rest of the year, well, it can't be normal, but we're trying to get it to COVID normal. We've got enough time to get exams done. We've got enough time and we think we've got a lot of thoughts going into, well, how would those exams look? I think that there are some significant challenges with online, uh, online exams. You know, the big long form exam that, that, um, that accounts for more than half the final mark, that's challenging. But there's a, there's a power of work going into how would we maintain distance, how would we get students in and out, how would we make that safe? Uh, so people should be reassured that there's a lot of work going on to get us to that point. And uh, I think the question was asked yesterday, as soon as I can give parents, uh, teachers and staff, and most importantly students, uh, certainty about what term four looks like, I absolutely will. Uh, I can't guarantee that it'll be a normal term four. Uh, I think the chances of it being a normal term four, there'll be restrictions, there'll be changes, there'll be modifications of one sort or another, because nothing about 2020 is uh, normal. And just on contact tracing, I know that sure. Brett Sutton said yesterday, and we have far more than the reports yesterday morning that said we had half of New South Wales. Can you tell us exactly how many contact traces we have on deck in Victoria now? So I think the whole team, uh, and again, I'm more than happy to come back and provide any further information if I uh, don't have any of these numbers absolutely accurate. Uh, about 2,600, that covers a whole range of different roles. I think on the floor, as in on the phones, uh, it's as many as 14 or 1,500. Uh, I think yesterday, because this question was asked, I think there was a report, not sure where the report came from, but there was a report that said there was 150 people making phone calls. That's, that's just wildly wrong. Um, there were a thousand yesterday, so it varies from day to day. So, for instance, if you had more uh, mystery cases rather than less, then you might be doing more of those calls, more interviews, uh, 
numbers too. So a 700 day obviously presents a bigger challenge than a 216, if it was, if I'm right yesterday, uh, or 222 the day before. Those those numbers will probably determine exactly how many are on shift. But as I as I understand it, my latest update, but I will double check for you, 2600 up to 14 that are on the phones in one form or another. Uh, and yesterday's number, I think, was 1000. So th it, it's a massive team and it, it sort of flexes based on the challenge of the challenge of the day. So whatever the virus throws up by way of numbers and the types of cases, uh, as well as you know, different different outbreaks as well. But uh, yeah, I um, uh, we'll, we'll be very pleased to have a day when we only need 150 people on the phone. That day's not coming uh, for a while yet. We had an example on the radio this morning of um, a woman whose contact tra her contacts weren't contacted until four weeks after she believes or, or her family believes that she contracted the virus, which was actually after she had she had passed yeah. away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, should that kind of thing happen? It's certainly not the only example we've heard of contacts yeah. not being right. contacted sure. until you know two, two weeks, and in some cases, in this case, four weeks yeah, after I, the incident. I, I, I'm assuming that that's the same case that Alex has. But I'll make the same comment again. We obviously send our deepest condolences and sympathies to that family, and uh, it's it's a matter for them whether they want to give us their name. That's entirely it's entirely up to them. Uh, that may have happened while on, while I've been in here, but uh, as I as I left my office to come to this media briefing, uh, we hadn't yet got the name, but we're working, I think, with the broadcaster to to get that if if the family want to, and then we'll chase that up. And if there's any, as I said, if there's any, if it, well, what what happened? That's the first thing. And then, if there's any learnings from that, then of course we would, we would seek to uh, make any changes. Uh, and again, our deepest sympathies to that family. It's already a very difficult time. Any sense that they weren't supported properly, I don't, I don't want that. Tell me, are you concerned about the optics of seeing uh, military uniforms on Victorian streets earlier in the pandemic? Oh, look, I saw a bit of a report about that. Uh, I think April was a very different time to where we are now. We were in a state of disaster in the bushfires. We had army. We were in a state of disaster now because of the pandemic. We have army. I'm deeply grateful to all the ADF. There's many, many of them here, and they're doing a fantastic job. Uh, you know, we've we've sought their help in lots of different areas, uh, and they're doing all of us as uh, Australians proud. And I'm very, so very well, grateful. The pandemic, you were well, I think about well, not con I don't think concern is the right word. I don't think anybody in peacetime wants to necessarily see the military on every street corner. I don't think any that that would that would be a sign that things were not as you would like them to like them to be. Uh, but I wouldn't want anyone to draw from that. Uh, any inference that uh, that we didn't absolutely value the work they're doing, Stanley, hey. but from from all of those in our in our health department, people from uh, Victoria Police, our other emergency services, there on their behalf, I say thank you as well, and indeed on behalf of all uh, Victorians, uh, the work that they're doing is very very important. But at the same time, though, other state capitals who we will never meet or see on the streets because they're doing it all from their state capital. And then there's private sector people who are working really hard. And then there's uh, a number of other Commonwealth public servants that are doing that work too. So it's a big team and they're all doing the very best they can. So that played a role in, in being reluctant to invite the military in earlier in the pandemic? No, we weren't reluctant to do that. They've been here from the very beginning, playing lots of different roles. But obviously today, the state of disaster today is very different to where things are at in February or April or whenever it might have been. So we are deeply grateful to all of them. And if there's more needed, uh, I'd be confident that uh, when I asked the Prime Minister, the answer would be yes, which is exactly the way that it should be. Any other issues? Uh, I think you covered this just a little bit, but just on the sure. testing, um, you obviously said that you want to stay above 20,000. Can we just get a general? Oh, I, well, I think 20,000 is uh, just, just to be... Uh, as uh, as concise as I can, twenty thousand is a, is roughly our average. So if you've got below average, then obviously that's that's a cause for concern. Having said that, though, Alan's made I think the key point that I tried to make, but maybe didn't make it as well the other day. As as you have less illness, you'll have less symptoms. As you have less symptoms, you have less people coming forward and getting tested. So it's it, there's no hard and fast number. We just got a sense that there was a trend, and that some of the numbers were a bit lower than we would than we would like. But obviously. Uh, it'll be it'll be guided by uh, over time the number of people who have got symptoms. So that's what's really important. If you have any symptoms whatsoever, even really mild symptoms, at the onset of those symptoms, so as fast as you can, you've got to get to a testing site, get tested, stay at home till you get your results. 
that's a really important thing to do. Uh, the other point as well is if you if you're suddenly turning around and you've got you know 10, 15, 20 percent of tests positive, then that probably tells you you're missing something. We're not we're nowhere near that. But again, this is part of the challenge. You know, you've got uh, things you do today that don't necessarily show up in the way this virus presents for 10 days or two weeks. And I, I think we just we didn't want to. We didn't want to wait any longer before we started just again to remind people, please come forward and get, get tested. And we'll, we'll continue to do that because it becomes arguably, well, it's always important, but it becomes arguably more important the smaller the numbers because that's when you're getting close to making some very big decisions about whether you allow movement again, whether you take some of these restrictions off. So at that point, the most complete picture, uh, that's when it becomes, well, I, I think, uh, even more important than it is, it is now. We're going to be uh, you know, doing a lot of things very differently for the rest of this year, whether it be wearing masks, keeping our distance, being you know, so focused on hand hygiene and these sorts of things, not necessarily gathering in really large groups uh, and coming forward and getting tested when we've got even the mildest symptoms. That'll, that'll serve us really well. Bernie, we're getting reports of hundreds of students gathering on um, campus at McKinnon Secondary College to uh, take an exam or somehow gather in a, in a hall. If um, That's got to be against the rules, hasn't it? Uh, I'd need to have a look at that for you before I... I know that school well. Uh, they're, a, they're an outstanding public school, but I would, uh, I'm happy to chase that up for you. Yes. Are you hoping that we do see probably not as large drops, but considerably large drops? I think we will continue to see active cases come down. Um, Logic just tells you as you've got less new cases each day and then the time elapses where the majority of people will recover. Although, Alex, it's a very good question because we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there are a number of people, and I think it is, it's not an insignificant number of people, for whom this is not, the, uh, not a common cold, where you have it for, for a period of time, and then it goes, and you're really a week, two weeks later, you can't even remember having, having had it. There are a number of people for whom this is a persistent issue. Uh, so many of their symptoms, whether it's fatigue, shortness of breath, those sorts of symptoms. So chronic condition, so it's there for a period of, a longer period of time, not something that you shake in a week or so. So that'll be, that might be one reason why we would continue to see active cases for longer than that, that traditionally agreed life cycle, 10 to 14, 14 days. But uh, yeah, I think we'll see active cases come down because that, that that's coming off the list. That will come down because less are going onto the list, if, if that makes sense. Any other issues? Again, if you've got symptoms, even mild symptoms, as soon as you get them, please come forward and get tested. There's 190 plus sites across the state. Simple thing, small thing, but it makes a massive difference. Uh, thank you all very much and we'll see you tomorrow.